All right, welcome everyone. I'm Alex Dana Dye, and I'm a director of our data science initiative here at Texas State. And we're really excited to have you join us today. Um, we're continuing with our big ideas week on campus. And today we're focusing on data science. So earlier today, we focused more on industry partnerships, uh, especially with Accenture Corporation. This afternoon, we're fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Larry Fulton from the College of Health Administration and undergraduate student Callie Ball, who have been working on some very exciting data science projects. So uh, Larry and Callie, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So, I mean, uh, we've got a number of uh, things that uh, we'll be looking to cover. Um, you guys are working on a lot of exciting projects here at Texas State. Uh, to start off, just tell us a little bit about your background at, at Texas State and data science more broadly. Okay. If you wanted to take it away. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start. And Alex, what I've been doing for the last couple of years while at Texas State has been working with Deep Vision. And I've enjoyed doing that. What we're looking for is classification of MRIs and classification of x-rays. And the reason I've been focused on that so much is because we can do a better job with machine learning algorithms that employ uh, deep vision techniques. We can do a better job than pathologists, radiologists, and other people in getting it right the first time. And then we can eventually field that to the pathologists and the physicians to look at. But the opportunity is such that if we don't do it, I'm going to argue that it will be tantamount to malpractice we don't start using machine learning in our hospitals and our health facilities in the future. Yeah, yeah. so uh, this is going to be my first kind of delve into the machine learning AI uh, like fields. Um, normally what I do is like chemistry, biology, physics. I'm the supervising lead tutor at the Student Learning Assistance Center. Uh, and so uh, I took a honors contract course with Dr. Fulton last semester that kind of introduced me to uh, doing more research in, in the AI field. So uh, that's kind of my background in it. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it sounds like uh, you've both been working on this main project that, that Larry's been mentioning. Um, and it sounds like a lot of interesting findings are already coming out. I mean, so Larry, as I'm aware, uh, it's, a lot of it's been uh, Alzheimer's uh, advances you've really been working on in this domain. Can you fill us in a little bit more about uh, the headway you guys have been making there? Yeah, absolutely. So working with Dr. Yan Yan from Computer Science and a few other people, uh, we have been able to do classification using 4D MRIs. So MRI slices all the way across the spectrum that have successfully identified Alzheimer's cases with 99% plus accuracy the first time through. So these algorithms can then be applied directly to the imagery and it saves time for reading because the treatment's going to be similar. But more importantly, the expansiveness of the technology of deep vision goes beyond just looking at MRIs. We can train our algorithms to identify anomalies, regardless of what the anomaly type is, in radiology, such as lungs, uh, lung x-rays, and uh, histopathology analyses. And, and the like. And what we found out from the from doing so is that we're able to classify diseases and pick up diseases that some others might miss when, when using machine learning technology. And of course that requires big data. But one of the things I'll point out real quickly and then I'll shut up is that a histopathologist might be 80% accurate in detecting cancer in the borders of cells. Okay, machine learning, we're going to be 95 to 98% accurate, and some, some maybe even higher than that. So it's a shift in philosophy. We really need to start thinking about using our algorithms first and training them to maybe overdiagnose, but that reduces the workload on the other end and also reduces the errors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it sounds like uh, there's definitely a complementary role between uh, medical providers and how the, the algorithms can, you know, help each other, right? It can make exactly. their work easier, more accurate, say, you know, uh, prevent, uh, you know, errors from happening. Um, and it sounds like you guys also have had very complementary roles on this project. I mean, Callie, uh, how have you fit in on this and where, what have you taken the lead on as part of this? Uh, so 
like I mentioned earlier, I, we turned it into an honors contract course. And so part of that was kind of discussing how the course would look different than your regular one. Um, and so uh, I was discussing this with Dr. Fulton and he mentioned a good idea would be to do a literature review um, on uh, AI and the, its applications and the healthcare field. He focused more specifically on Alzheimer's detecting through a pattern recognition software with ML. Um, and I did more of a general literature review. I, I focused on a few examples um, with uh, like identifying geoplastomas, which is a, a brain, a really nasty form of brain tumor um, and uh, breast cancer as well, like mammogra mammography, sorry. Uh, and then I explained more broadly kind of what AI was and machine learning, deep learning, um, and I touched also on like natural language processing, which are all kind of techniques used by AI. And that's so, weird. You, you just won an award for this. Is that correct? Uh, so, Larry, Larry uh, has put you, on, uh, put you out there on it. So he told me at least. So uh, the, the essay is going to be submitted to the Richard Stoll uh, essay competition. And so I haven't won any awards yet. I want to <laughs> make that clear. Um, but uh, it's under the... Oh, sorry. Did you, you have actually something? you actually did win a book award for your performance oh, yes. the uh, AYUPA, the Association for Undergraduate uh, Health Programs, and so she won a book. Essentially, it's a, a free library award for her performance as an undergraduate student in her program. Part of that is related to her work on the machine learning project. So yes, she did win an award. She's being a little bit shy about it. I think. Very excited about that too. I've been looking for more reading material. So that came in at the perfect opportunity or like perfect time. So oh, congratulations. Thank um, you. Thank you. So another thing um, sometimes with data science that's not fully recognized is that it's, there's not, you know, it's a new field. And so there's not one dominant perspective. It's not necessarily mathematics or computer science or domain specific knowledge. You mentioned, uh, tell us a little bit more about your background and, um, you know, where you're coming from and then the data science techniques that you've picked up as part of doing this. Uh, so as you were mentioning that, I was thinking that uh, you mentioned that there are different, there's a lot of different facets of uh, the data science that's being used. And that's kind of why it fits so well within healthcare, uh, because healthcare itself is a very dynamic environment. Um, and I think that I can apply a lot of what I've learned in statistics. I had to take a statistics course um, through the university. And I think that a lot of what we did in the quality course that I took with Dr. Fulton that was made into an honors contract course uh, was uh, using applied statistics to do like quality control, um, making sure that the system was in control, that kind of thing. So um, a lot of the mathematics is, is applied to the data science, um, especially in kind of harnessing it and organizing it in a way that is usable. Yeah, so it sounds like um, you've, you've had a broader STEM background, but really actually the data science is new. Is that fair to say or that you really picked it up really quickly uh, towards this end? So I would, I would ask you to define the data science in, in particular because there's, you know, I know that we mentioned bef previously, not in this uh, interview, um, but CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9, um, the, uh, the part of that was actually discovered like quite quite a some time ago, um, but we're just now using the applications of it uh, just recently in the past like decade or so. So um, there are different areas, I guess you could say that are new in those that we have kind of built on um, in the in the past couple of years. So. so so Callie's background's in STEM. She was a biology major before she came to HA and now she's biology minor which is a great thing. My background's in management science information systems, decision science stats from University of Texas. And so legitimately, I acquired my data science interest while working with a PhD candidate from Penn State. So having sat on his committee and worked with him, that really got me interested. And then I worked at Texas Tech for a while with an individual who is a uh, one of the leading researchers for brain sciences. So it just seemed like a, a natural progression for me. I pulled Callie on board because she's uniquely, uniquely gifted. She's capable of handling both the research algorithms that we needed and she's, I, I can tell you, she's universally has more energy than most people. So she's a very fast learner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it's a, 
it one the whole topic and not the whole topic but um the just the stem field in general is very fascinating to me and so it was very easy to do research about it uh just because i was really fascinated by the material that i was kind of uncovering so thank you <laughs> but it was no, it was like relatively uh, like a you know it sounds like it's been a great thing. partnership uh, along those yeah. lines for sure um actually if i can insert a plug along these lines then that we uh we take a lot of pride in our, our data science training programs that we've been establishing as part of this initiative and in that we have students from a variety of STEM uh, in liberal arts fields, our College of Applied Arts. And what's really nice is that uh, it really becomes complementary in that, um, you know, a lot of time, you know, our data scientists know more about biology and a lot of uh, history because the historians who learn data science to use um, automatic data processing in that domain, same with our political scientists who learn this. And so it's really been a learning experience for, I mean, I'm learning all the time from them about these different domains as well. So it's really exciting. It sounds like, um, you know, Larry, you've come to this uh, in a similar way that, you know, I mean, the way we do things today is frankly not the way we did them in 2018, right? And that's not the way we did Absolutely. them in 2015. I, I tell you, the change has been radical. Uh, and if I stayed in my comfort zone, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing now because of the rapid change. We've gone from having to use big computer clusters to do any sort of analysis like what we're doing now to being able to do so on the cloud with Google Colab and Python and, and on R to do analysis that means uh, a world of difference. I think that to stay on top of it requires a lot of dedication and motivation for the education on your own part because the degrees that were produced even five years ago, the doctorate degrees, it was rare to have a doctorate in data science, for example. And now that's becoming more and more commonplace. So if you have a, a former degree, a PhD from somewhere, if you haven't kept up in the discipline, it's really hard to catch up. We do things differently. Mm -hmm. No, it's definitely a major growth segment uh, for careers and a real opportunity for our students, especially uh, you know, surely we've both seen a lot of uh, amazing first generation students come through, uh, you know, probably the, the, the recent director of our, you know, uh, internal data science operation worked at Outback Steakhouse for 10 years before coming to us. And uh, in fact, he brought a lot of the restaurant industry like optimization uh, stuff actually ended up being very applicable to, to what we're doing. So really, it's, it's really the Wild West right now. It's really an exciting time. It's kind of like smartphones 15 years ago or computer science 30 or 40 years ago. A lot of change. And um, you were mentioning about, you know, the resources changing and resource utilization changing, and you were a major uh, part recently of us acquiring some uh, state-of-the-art resources from AMD uh, towards COVID research. We might have I, uh, asked you a little bit about that. Oh, not at all. Oh, it was kind of fun, actually. I got to work with members from all over the university, uh, engineering, Sasha Dong, uh, computer science, Yan Yan, of course, Eric Dean, uh, who is the lead, really, who made this all happen, pulled us all together. And we put it in a request for, essentially, it was going to be a small equipment request for AMD, but based upon our write-up and what we're doing in the department and our use of big data, uh, AMD upgraded it essentially to a large award. And that award is about 330,000 uh, with equipment and cloud-based computing resources, which we're going to use. Uh, we're gonna use it heavily for uh, both machine learning, deep vision type work, as well as uh, big data projects involving analyzing EHRs to look for undiagnosed cases of Chagas disease, for example, which is Chagas disease, for those who don't know, is a disease that primarily affects the southern United States. It's from the kissing bug. And the kissing bug is a nice little bug that can bite you and then defecate in your wound and give you a nice little parasite. So we're, it's a hard, it's a hard disease to detect. So by using the medical records and having the big resource capabilities, we can do things that are crazy, like build uh, nonlinear models, random forests, and, and all sorts of things to evaluate if we can uh, forecast those undetected cases. So it's, it's been great. Everybody in the university who's going to be using this uh, is going to be getting their money's worth because it's a top-notch system. Mm, certainly. Um, yeah, that's a great point you mentioned about forecasting, right? Because that's a, a major aspect of data science is not, you know, especially with COVID, right? If all the data are always, you know, two weeks old and we're always kind of playing catch up, if we can predict things before they happen, uh, it really gives us uh, a head start. And you're mentioning, you know, assistance and diagnostics and so on, right? So 
as we're in this moment right now, what would be, uh, you know, you propose a different uh, number of applications with AMD. As far as specifically for COVID, what would be uh, the one or two things you're most excited about where this new supercomputing equipment could be used for? Well, one of the things is we can get down to the individual level of observation and do some GIS analysis, uh, particularly regarding the, the disease cycle. Now, how useful that will be during this disease cycle is different than how useful it will be for future disease cycles. So it's pandemic analysis, and we can get to the individual ins instead of the hospital unit of analysis. We can get the uh, sets of EHRs from facilities, and we'll have the ability to mine information out of there to see if that we can get indicators, especially. Also, there's a set of people that we don't know that have been exposed, right? So estimating that set of people is also important. One of the things I did want to highlight kind of off topic that that I intend for us to use this as well is not just medical research. When we're talking forecasting, we're able to use imagery based analysis coupled with flat files, two dimensional files, for example, and forecast, I don't know, sales of footwear associated with a particular company. I have happened to work with a different uh, uh, a different contract on that. So that's near and dear to my heart, but we can forecast sales in sales where in the fashion industry are very difficult to do. So by classifying images into like types and using information from the past and linking it to imagery analysis, uh, we can generate some forecasts uh, along with other systemic variables. And this all takes huge uh, computational capability, the type that AMD has been uh, graciously has awarded to us. No, I'm, I'm glad you highlighted that, uh, you know, these multi-purpose applications and that often they, they cross platforms, right? With our data science initiative, you know, we're focusing on different domains, you know, be it health, uh, society, and business. And so, you know, you know as you're mentioning, this is really not an independent uh, situation where, you know, the hottest hires in finance right now are linguists, right? Because natural language processing is predict, is, you know, how do you predict what someone's going to say next is very hard to do. So if you can do that, you can predict all sorts of things. And I'm really glad that you highlighted that domain there. I mean, we have, you know, all sorts of uh, supported research, whether it's by, you know, Fortune 500 companies, you know, NIH, Department of Defense, National Science Foundation. Um, and Larry, you're at the center, you know, the College of Health Administration of a lot of these projects. Can you give us an example of you know, one of the, you know, ones that you're most excited about this moment beyond COVID as well, because we're really covering, you know, COVID is here and we're, we're making headway, but we're also going to keep uh, pushing towards a lot of other things that are going on as well. Sure. So one of the things that excites me is the work that Google's doing on EHR. And that trickles down, if Google's doing it, researchers are doing it in the facilities. But the idea here is that Google has started a project for using EHR and natural language processing from physicians' comments coupled with uh, data, quantitative and qualitative data, putting them together to forecast and provide a, essentially a physician's diagnosis based upon data per, for the physician to review. It could be X, Y, or Z. These decision support pieces. And these decision support pieces in some cases are turning out to be better than the physician's analysis right up front. So in healthcare, what we talk about is the identification of zebras, identification of zebras. When people come into facilities, we think of them as horses generally. You know, you're a, a young, healthy female or male. You probably don't have X, Y, or Z. So you're a horse and we get all these horses in, but then the zebra comes in. How do we determine the zebra? It gets missed because we get conditioned to the fact that everything's a horse. It gets missed unless you overtrain algorithms to identify something as a zebra instead of a horse, which is the cool thing about machine learning. We can legitimately train the algorithm to slightly overclassify, or even grossly if we wanted to, overclassify things as zebras so that they'll at least get a look at by the physician that way. And so that, that leaks into our department, not just the fact that Google and, and some other healthcare records, EHR records providers are trying to do that, it gets into our piece and it filters down to even say the Chagas project I mentioned, which is a funded 1.5 million, 2 million, depends on which grants and contracts you count, uh, led by Paula Stigler-Granados in the department. And 
that research has the potential because we are cutting edge on, on this research, frankly, thanks to Dr. Stilgler Granados. It has the potential to leverage the same type of thing that Google is using, that some of these EHR providers are attempting to use, and that others like Johns Hopkins and Mayo Clinic and others are trying to use. Now, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up because I have a tendency to go off. This is interesting to me, obviously, is that if we don't start doing that now, there's going to be a point where facilities will face malpractices because things could have been diagnosed using the technology that we have available that are not diagnosed now. And yeah, let me follow up with you on that actually briefly. I'll bring you, sorry, I'll bring you back for more. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that's not widely known actually is one of the major causes of death in America is medical errors. You bet. How is the work that you're doing um, going in to prevent medical errors? You know, you meant it's kind of like detecting these zebras are often the kind of cause of errors, right? How, how is your work specifically used so that we could prevent uh, medical errors from happening? Oh, that's great. And, and this is one of the things I'm working on right now. And I'm actually taking a little bit of a sabbatical, hopefully, um, to work this, work through this. One of the things that happens, and I mentioned a little bit of this earlier, is that when pathologists review, say, uh, samples of cells to determine if there's cancerous tissue in there, they get it right 80% of the time. Our diagnostic capability gets it right 95, 98% of the time if we use machine learning components. So you can, the funny thing is, is this goes for x-rays, it goes for MRIs, it goes for any imagery. So you can take that imagery and with the Android app and the mobile nets and some other things, you can, you can have pre-trained weights and you can use this so as a kind of a secondary line and implement it on a cellular phone so that you can take a picture of your own stuff wow. and categorize it. But not only that, is physicians, when they order tests, they're often looking for A. They're not looking for B, C, D, and E. Machine learning algorithms don't know if it's A, but they're gonna check for A, B, C, D, and E. And instead of being able to do one review of a imagery, they're gonna re review thousands and thousands in the same period of time that a radiologist, pathologist, or physician could review the, uh, the piece. Now that's only one fraction. We've talked about machine learning in healthcare. Eventually artificial intelligence is something I wanna to go to because machine learning is the brain behind most of AI, so, but later. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's really just the times are changing so quickly. Um, you know, both with the impact that we can make on society and also with degree of uh, student careers as well, as far as they get involved in this. I mean, Callie, can you tell us a little bit uh, both uh, in your experience and also as you, you mentioned, you have a, a leadership role in tutoring, you know, how data science can uh, make changes uh, as far as careers and, and where you're headed next and where people are headed next? Yeah, so I actually recently did a project. Well, it, it was a project of last year, but it was on uh, natural language processing and how whenever recruiters are going through uh, submissions of like resumes to their organization, how time consuming that can be, especially if you have an applicant pool that has more than say 50, 100 applicants. Uh, and so part of uh, you know the environment that I'm going into as a healthcare administrator, I may be on a hiring team at some point. And so, at, and I have been on a hiring team at my work. Uh, we recently hired up a new coordinator, um, David Beadle, uh, this past semester, and I was kind of able to sit on the interview board for that. But for, I guess, more general applicants, uh, I know that organizations have started gravitating towards the usage of NLP in kind of narrowing down the applicant pool. So what they'll do is, is they'll say, we want somebody with Excel skills, or we want somebody who has servant leadership uh, tendencies, that kind of thing. And they will uh, put those in to the algorithm and then narrow down the applicant pool from say 500 applicants to like 50. And that's a lot more manageable uh, for them as hiring managers to be able to say, okay, so you know we basically, made the time that we're spending on hiring more efficient. Um, and uh, that is just one of the applications that I can think off of right off the top of my head of where we can use this kind of data science to make, uh, you know, make our time usage more efficient and more effective too. 
Right. No, it sounds like um, you're, you're hitting on a number of different domains. Um, and you mentioned, yeah, so what, yeah, what's the next step for you actually, as far as uh, career wise, we want to show, you know, this is really impacting uh, students in so many different ways. Um, you, know, you mentioned some uh, healthcare administration work. I mean, what's next and, and where does data science fit in? So that's a really great question. That's a question I've been asking myself as well. <laughs> uh, senior year holds a lot of possibilities. Um, after graduation, I do not currently have a set plan yet. Um, it's either uh, grad school going straight into uh, where I will be interning at. I will be interning um, during the summer. And so it looks a little bit different for me because I'm finishing up on my minor and not graduating specific with my cohort specifically, like at that time. Uh, so it's dependent on a lot of things. Uh, I actually am studying for the MCAT as well to be able to take that in the spring. Um, and so med medical school may be on the boards for me. I uh, don't have a set answer for that yet. So <laughs> let me get back to you about it. All right. Well, uh, for the uh, med interviews, then if that happens, you'll have plenty to talk about. Yeah. Uh, really. Yes. Um, Alex, one, one thing on that is that if she does go to med school, there are a category of physicians who are heavily interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence right. uh, applications. So I think she'll have a, a great outlet uh, once she goes there. Yeah, now, we'll, uh, we'll make the live pitch now for you because you're seeing many fields. It's computational something. So, compu you know, apparently now I'm a computational psychiatrist on some days <laughs> uh, where but this is what it is, is that soon enough, you won't be able to do any of these fields with some kind of data literacy. Um, and so as we talk about today, we're forming those rules that in 2030 and 2040 will be commonplace, just like, you know, used to be they had classes on keyboarding, not even that long ago, right? Uh, and on uh, various computer uses or spreadsheet usage. And this is what's coming next. And so um, because it's so new, there's not really a single um, leader in this domain yet. And Texas State really has a chance to uh, become a new entrant in this field. It's a, it's a great point. Um, so along these lines, I mean, you mentioned AI and opening new doors, you know, the, the field keeps changing. Where, where do you see AI going and us at Texas State fitting in? So I see AI. Oh, no, go <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, you okay. got it. Okay. Uh, so let me gather my thoughts. Um, I see AI becoming a huge part of our, our healthcare environment. Um, I think that we already see, we have already seen in recent years, the shift towards telehealth. Um, and now even more so with COVID, uh, shifting a lot of um, checkups, virtual, shifting a lot of patient, um, patient uh, uh, documentation, all of that kind of like checking in to the hospital, checking in for your uh, annual checkup, that kind of thing, uh, virtually. And so I see it being uh, an augmentation to uh, clinician practice, definitely in diagnostic imaging. I think that right now it's viewed more so as an expert opinion um, and kind of like a secondary choice to kind of back up your initial diagnosis. Um, but I definitely see it playing a more prominent role. But I also see it getting some pushback uh, because any time that there is a disruption between the patient and physician that has historically been met with some pushback. Um, and so I, I, see it, I see it becoming a large part of our everyday practice, but I think that we have a, we have a couple more years before it's fully in implemented. Um, but I definitely think that there is a lot of value in being the forerunners for this because the, the point is, is that the change is going to come, <laughs> you know, it's not inevitable. And so the, the better that we can adapt and we can change with the dynamic environment that we're going into, the better able that we're to, to direct that in a way that's constructive. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, we're not gonna be able to do it without this soon enough. I mean, yeah, Larry, what, what are your views on this end as we're moving, you know, in the longer, uh, you know, years and decades views of, of how this is going? Well, I think our computer scientist department, our computer science department has, has it figured out that we're going that direction. But I did want to jump on the Callie's point about culture and everything else. There was a device developed by an anesthesiologist out of Grace Hospital in Texas Tech, near Texas Tech campus. It's in Lubbock. Uh, if you haven't been there, you probably haven't missed anything. Just kidding. Uh, at any rate, there's a device called the Cetasys. The Cetasys device was designed and patented by the anesthesiologist. And it was designed, it was artificial intelligence, 
which means that it uses it used machine learning algorithms, but it operated on its own to deliver anesthesia for minor procedures. This was bought by Johnson and Johnson. It was FDA approved, bought by Johnson and Johnson, and performed with fewer errors than anesthesiologists and nurses and nurse anesthetists. Anesthetists. At any rate, at the bottom of the day, it was scrapped because of the culture in healthcare. So we're going to go up against a little bit of that. We're going to have to show the value and show that we are not replacing, and we're not going to, we're not replacing physicians or pathologists or radiologists. We're changing their role. They're overtasked already. A radiologist can't go through a thousand x-rays in a minute. We can do that with ML algorithms. Now back on AI though, our, we have AI that has performed better on surgery than actual physicians. Totally autonomous. I'm not talking about the Da Vinci. Totally autonomous AI has performed better. So the link between man and machine and the algorithms underlying there are going to be more prevalent. Now, I do believe that that's going to require a lot of cross-disciplinary exchange and hence our translational health research and everything else that we have going on on the campus. The exchange will be between computer science, math, the, uh, the College of Health Sciences and our nursing and everything else. So I see that as being a very big growth industry, a growth department, along with the business department, which has a new MSDS, data science, because you have to understand the algorithms and boy, that's a full-time job in itself. The algorithms understand, underlying anything that we're trying to do. So in my humble estimation, the university is specially equipped with translational health to push forward what, the, what we're going to have in the future that we're seeing already. You're seeing glimpses of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as we're moving forward, um, you know, there's all sorts of things that, that we're working towards. And, and right now, um, following up on a question we have from the audience here as far as um, what, are the, what are the needs that uh, you would say we uh, have as far as research in this domain? whether it would be um, you know, equipment, uh, scholarships for students who can support the work, um, you know, direct connections to corporations. What, what are uh, the things that would help the most and what breakthroughs would you see us making given the right resources uh, that could come in? Okay, I'll start with that one. Larry. I agree with everything, yes. Everything you just said, <laughs> links to corporations, scholarships for students, additional programs focus on that, multidisciplinary graduate programs, PhD programs focus on that. I see that as all those being important, as well as fostering new relationships with universities that are what I would consider on the cutting edge of this. Uh, USC, Washington, some of these others, that's for brain sciences and the type and the like, so all these are necessary, but what's really cool about Texas State, in my humble opinion, is they're poning up the bar. They're putting their money where their mouth is. We've got the data science graduate program in the business school, which is awesome. We have money put aside for translational health research. There is always money available from Dr. Walt Horton. He has promised money for data sources that we need in order to do just this type of research more uh, cross-disciplinary connections, particularly with engineering, computer science, and the College of Health Professions. I see that, I see a little center eventually coming out of that, to be honest with you, uh, just mm -hmm. because of the need, what's going on in the future. No, I agree 100%. Uh, yeah, if I can insert my uh, pitch in here as well, uh, thank you, uh, audience questions for this. Um, but we're really proud of our, our data science training programs. And I mean, honestly, for about $2,000, we can train one student into uh, high-level data science. In fact, to the point where, you know, I have colleagues at New York University who ask, you know, which postdoc worked on this project. And I say, it was an undergraduate at Texas State. Right, you see this all the time, Larry, right? I mean, um, and it's really transformational, uh, both from the perspective of the work that's being done, right? You know, we, we're, um, you know, we're working with MS, uh, with Cleveland Clinic right now for multiple sclerosis to help you know, right now, if someone gets an MS diagnosis, uh, they don't know what's going to happen next necessarily. And so the progression could be one year or 15 years. And we're using, like you mentioned, electronic medical records to try to help with that prognosis so they can plan their lives accordingly to fit with that. 
So we can, you know, we really use it to make differences in patient lives ASAP. Yes. We can really do this quickly. Um, but it also makes a big difference in the students' lives and that these are such marketable skills that, you know, cross fields. I mean, Callie's an outstanding example of this, that, you know, we have people, again, from, you know, uh, social sciences, applied arts, uh, you know, traditional STEM fields, College of Science and Engineering, that um, with this program, we really just get everyone up to speed so quickly that just by doing, instead of, you know, classroom work is one aspect, but this real world work that you guys have done together is an awesome exemplar of learning so much so quickly that uh, it's a really exciting uh, opportunity for Texas State going forward and for us to be a leader in that way. Yeah, Absolutely. I 100. Oh, go sorry, go ahead. Kelly, please, yeah. Yeah, I 100% I agree. Uh, I think that what he mentioned with scholarships directed to the undergraduates or graduates participating in that kind of research is really important to kind of have a well-rounded exper college experience, right? So you, there's only, like you said, there's only so much that you can learn within lecture. There's only so much that you can learn within the classroom, but the majority of, of the skills that you will be applying to post-grad and whatever that looks like is going to be learned outside of the classroom. And so a big part of my research was kind of uh, taking independence in in my learning right uh so a lot of times a lot of times it can look like uh very passive learning where you're sitting in a lecture and you're receiving information right there's not much of an exchange i mean unless you're like in a university seminar where there's like small group discussion is encouraged which i see a lot of uh in the health professions uh college and so i, I do get i do get some of that like within lecture but a lot of the stuff that i have learned uh, actively has been outside of the classroom, kind of taking uh, independence and making making sure that I'm autonomous in my learning. Um, and so you can take that skill post grad into whatever you know discipline that you decide to go into. Because at the heart of it, you are always learning. It's a very very much shift towards uh, lifelong learning and taking uh, responsibility for what you're doing, like what you're learning. So. Yeah. Yeah. On this note, uh, like you'd mentioned an example of like taking a statistics class. How is it differ between something like that and working with Dr. Fulton on this project and, and uh, what you've learned in that way? So a lot of the a lot of the courses build kind of a baseline of what you're going to learn next, right? So, um, for example, I took organic chemistry, both one and two, and so a lot of the fundamentals that you learn in OCHEM one, you apply to OCHEM two. So if you don't understand that very basic um kind of ideas concepts you concepts you will have a more difficulty understanding the higher level uh, application of it and so that's what i kind of view statistics as was creating that very baseline of knowledge to be able to apply uh to different situations like i did in uh, dr fulton's quality class because a lot of it was process control um using statistics and the baseline of information that i learned from the class that i took so I see it as kind of building a foundation to go forward with. That sounds like very complimentary for you in that way, but it, you really need the second stage as well. I mean, um, that's really a big thing we're trying to do with this data science initiative is increase the amount of these opportunities. Because right now, you know, we have with Dr. Fulton, we have some, we have some in different departments on campus. And what we're really looking to do is if, um, you know, as we, uh, you know, gather resources together is that, you know, can we do this for hundreds of students at once, thousands of students at once, working on real world problems with real companies. So as opposed to just waiting or here in the classroom and having to learn later, everyone kind of wins at the same time. I mean, Larry, it sounds like that's been a pretty common experience for you to see this on our, uh, on the scale that we've done so far. Yeah, I tell you what, I'm really happy with what you're doing, Alex. Uh, I tell you it's necessary. So we believe in the College of Health Administration or in the uh, School of Health Administration, excuse me. Uh, we believe in certification processes. So there are four certificates that our students attempt to attain as part of their educational process because that shows that they have the skill set, they really have the skill sets. But we try to get those skill sets applied with a small subset of the students. We try to get those skill sets applied to real world analysis. So we have that at both the graduate and the undergraduate level. So at the graduate level, they also take a certification, set of certifications and they work with uh, on our Chagas research, for example, gets their hands dirty and wet and they get publications. And in fact, one of the goals for our graduate program 
is that every student has worked on and gone through the publication process, meaning that they've been part of a research productivity team. So that's at the graduate level. At the undergraduate level, we get them the foundational information and the certificates. And then the special people like Kali, who's a major, a minor, and an honors person, plus the tutor at Slack, plus uniquely gifted. We get some of those in to work with like what I was working on because they're really good at what they do. And I like the undergraduate research a lot. So we're expanding that for even the rest of the students. Now, I would love to talk to you offline about the uh, data certificates as well, sir. Oh, certainly. How, yeah, that, no, it's definitely uh, something that we're looking forward to the chance to follow up on that. I mean, how much do you think, you know, let's say, you know, if we could consolidate these resources and add from contributions from corporations and individual support uh, from people interested in Texas State, how much would you say we could scale up this, this training operation with real world activities uh, towards, uh, you know, real world companies, whether it's in health and business, you know, what would be the amount of, of increase in scale that you think we could see? Well, okay, so we have about just roughly 33,000 undergraduate students in nice. Texas State right now. And with that amount, and the amount of healthcare, I'm just going healthcare field right now, amount of healthcare associated in the triangle, that's between uh, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. We already are able to place all of our healthcare administration students and residencies because the need is there before they graduate. So they all take a residency. So I would assume that being scalable, that you could probably reach four, five, six thousand over time. You know, you can set the goal. The demand is going to be there. It's getting the right skill set into the student that the, that the organization can use. And if we can show that we have those skill sets that our students are coming out with them, they'll be gobbled up right away. So one of the reasons why we do four certificates, external certificates in our program, in the Bachelor's of Healthcare Administration, is because my median time to employment for my students is less than a month. Right, it's, it's, usually probably ne it's probably negative months, right, in most cases. <laughs> in, uh, in some cases, because the residencies, right, they get gobbled up by the, by the health, I mean, the hospital and healthcare industries uh, is going to grow 20% over the next 10 years, according to the Census Bureau. And in that set, every subcomponent now has a vested interest in having data science capability, whether it be for natural language processing, whether it be just pure data mining, whether it be for uh, imagery or recognition, whether it's for quality improvement, because the Joint Commission, which accredits hospital, requires evidence of quality improvement. That takes the ability to data mine and the uh, ability to, to produce uh, essentially quantitative product. I mean, that's really remarkable. I mean, we're talking, you know, something right now that's usually kind of, um, you know, one group or another. We're talking on the scale of thousands of students at once. I mean, that's a really fantastic opportunity. I mean, both for the students and for the, uh, the industrial partners. And I, let's say, you know, like we've had people work with MD Anderson. And by the time they're done as a student, MD Anderson hires them, right? You bet. Right now we have uh, HEB projects on campus where students are working on them. By the time they're done, they know HEB procedures and they're ready to go. So they, they kind of get a starter work with the students. The students learn how it works. And if they like it, it really works out great. So that's really awesome that we can uh, think about this. You know, right now it's on a scale of, you know, dozens, perhaps students, right? On a scale of thousands would really be transformational uh, and maybe make us a leader as a university in this field in Texas and frankly, the world in that way. That's really, uh, that would be really inspiring. We've always been, we started out as an educational school, but we have a research component and we're going, I know the focus is tier one and we're pushing towards that. But as part of that, there's no reason that there's nothing that says we can't be tier one with part of our undergraduate and graduate research students helping us get there and helping the community as well as the industry as it is. The service component of this is huge to me. I would love to see three to 5,000 students in this because the service component, there is a service component. I don't mean, and I don't mean just not all, not, not all projects will be, have a service component, but providing back to the healthcare facilities, particularly and giving them things they need to me, that's adding back to the community and its service. So 
It really is. I think it's a great point. It really has this scalable effect on our community, right? It if does. Out what we need locally, it really allows uh, us to continue. I mean, in many ways, you know, let's say MD Anderson has rightfully said that it's Texas's gift to the world in a way, right? And I think uh, we can also provide a real uh, benefit to our community in this way through the great work that's done through that. I mean, um, we've covered a, a lot of ground today. Uh, you know, we've covered, you know, a lot of health ground, research, business, societal goodwill, uh, you know, real life altering differences in student training opportunities. And so I really appreciate you guys uh, joining us and being able to highlight some of this to really see it in person, right? It's one thing to kind of read a statistic about data science is the hottest career, uh, but it's another to really see it in action, both uh, for the student work and, uh, and for what the products are. I mean, as we wrap up, are there any last things that you'd like our audience to know? Kelly, why don't you go first? Well, I was actually hoping you'd go first because I have a, <laughs> a couple ideas. Um, but I would just say that this is an area worth investing in um, and investing deeply in. And I think that it starts with our undergraduates. I think that it starts there because from there you can either go into the workforce and use your skills that you've learned uh, during your college experience or even into graduate school, whether that looks like law school or med school whatever have you. Um, I, I think that, like you were mentioning, it, it has a trickle down effect, right? So the people that we are, you know, employing into the world with these skills, all of that boils down to what we can do to better our community, to better our world. And the end user to that really is the patient, I guess, in, in healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can produce better quality outcomes with the data that is available, to, have, to be able to harness that and to use it um, to produce better quality outcomes, the, the end user is the patient, the end user is us, because at any point in time, we will be the patient, you know? Um, and so I, I just, I think that to put it very simply, this is an idea worth investing in and we need to embrace the change wholeheartedly. Wow, I mean, I don't know how I could say it any better than that, Callie, that was well-spoken, well-said. Uh, I will say one thing as a faculty member, uh, the students are, are our credentials by providing them the ability to have big data credentials. It represents Texas State well. And so I think we have an obligation as faculty, staff, administration to invest heavily in this because this, whether we like it or not, is going to change the way we do business and is changing the way we do business. So incorporating the student part into the process is to me the the exact right answer and the last thing i'll say is uh, callie i'm very proud of you thank you i appreciate that well no thank you both uh you know i'm honored to share in this university as you as well so we'll have a group zoom hug perhaps uh but uh all kidding aside um you know it's really inspiring to work here with such great people working towards uh, real noble goals and, um, you know, to degree, you know, for uh, our audience to degree, you'd like to follow up, please don't hesitate to reach out with us directly through university advancement. Um, we always love to hear from people inside the university, from alumni, from all sorts of stakeholders. We really, uh, it really inspires us to engage further that way. Uh, so with that, I'll leave with that. And thank you, Larry and Kelly so much for, again, for joining us today.